Morning. 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 Everyone say Redeeming Love. Redeeming Love. It's a great name for a church, isn't it? Welcome, Redeemer family. The Apostle Paul has given us instructions about what it is we are to sing about when we gather on Sunday mornings like this. Listen to his word in Colossians 3.16. He says, Lord, let the word about Christ, your English Bibles normally translate that as let the word of Christ. It has the idea of let the message of Christ take up permanent residence in you, not just part-time on Sunday mornings or Saturday nights, but full-time, permanent residence in you, extravagantly, with all wisdom, as you teach and admonish one another, using psalms and hymns in your singing as you sing to your hearts to God. So, Paul gives instruction for our conversation. It's the word about Christ. Where do we get the word about Christ? Where is the word about Christ found? Genesis through Revelation. So, the apostle gives us instruction for our daily conversation and for our worship songs. Notice this morning, every single song is packed with what? With Christ. Our worship team selects these songs to feed us who? Christ. We need Christ. We need Christ every day. We need Christ throughout the day. And the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, gives us a feast of Christ. Not long from now, I'll show you from Proverbs 8, how Jesus is talked about as the wisdom of God prior to the creation. But today, focus our hearts on Christ through this banquet that the worship team feeds us this morning. Pray with me. God, thank you for the hope that we have in Christ, but also for the presence we have today. He's not a future Savior. He's a present Savior. He's alive. He's here. He's with us. He accompanies us. He's our forgiver, our guide, our shepherd. Yes, he is the morning star, but he is our everything. We need Christ. We need to feed on his life today and to feed on his power. Some need his forgiveness this morning. And I pray that it would come forth like Niagara Falls, that fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, Jesus' veins, let us, Lord, be soaked this morning with Christ, drenched with Christ. Ignite a new flame of love for Christ, mm. our Redeemer. And we want redeeming love, actually, to be our theme till we die. And all of God's people said, right on, and amen, and all that stuff. Yeah. Brothers, yeah. let's worship Christ. Feast of Christ. Thank you, team. You may have a seat for a moment. And then we'll stand to read uh, scripture in just a second. But once again, thank you, team. They're short staff this morning, but they did a tremendous job in presenting us with the Savior. Some of you remember uh, a good friend of the Cole family. He was the principal at Northside for a number of years in the elementary school. His name was Tony, married to Jane Horning. Remember, uh, you were perhaps a member of the Hornings. Tony was uh, a Civil War fan. Uh, not that he liked war, but he was a history student and he loved the history of the Civil War. And he had a little penchant for paintings that uh, artists would do of various Civil War scenes. And he could spot a particular artist's painting without even looking at the signature in the bottom of the painting. Just by the way the artist uh, configured the figures and the battle scene, the use of colors, the shading, he knew that that was either a Dale Gallant photo or that was a Troiana photo. He could just, he was really sharp. Well, in scripture, Luke, which is what we're focusing on for these months, especially on preparing leaders to li live a lot of lifestyles of forgiveness, Luke has a penchant that the other gospel writers don't. Luke's way of writing is different from John's and Mark's. Matthew, completely different. And one noted difference, which I'm going to show you, is how he'll take an analogy from one part of life and jam it into a story. And it doesn't fit, it looks like, until you study what comes before it and what comes after it. Let me show you an illustration of that. If you have a copy of Scripture, either on your phone or in your head or a hard copy, turn to Luke 17. I'm not going to be expounding this passage, but only to show you how Luke is like a seamstress. 
He'll take a little patch of this, a little patch of that, a little patch of that, and he molds it together or sews it together, as the analogy is, to make a point. Luke 17 is an example of how he is like an artist or a seamstress. Verses 1 through, um, 1 through, thir no, 1 through 10, uh, my Bible is so marked up sometimes I can't see where the verses begin and end, but 1 through 10 is all one issue. It's about forgiveness. And yet, look at all the various strands that are used here to make this point. He says, Jesus said to his disciples, that you can include that he's beginning a new theme. Things that cause people to sin are bound to come, but woe to that man or woman through whom they come. It would be better for him to be thrown into the Gulf of Mexico. That's in the Greek. Uh, I'm just kidding. Thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around his neck that for him to cause one of these little ones to sin so... Watch out for yourselves. Well, what's he talking about? What sin is he talking about? He hasn't named that yet. He hasn't told us. Then he says, if your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. Oh, now we're getting clued in here to the subject. If he sins against you seven times in a day, seven times comes back to you and says, I repent, forgive him. There's the word forgive used twice. And the apostles say to the Lord, increase our faith, which is a cop out. Like, we can't do that. We need more faith to be able to forgive people. And he says, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, see, he's bringing in another analogy to make the point. You can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and be planted in the sea, and it will obey you. So, in other words, you don't, you don't need more faith. You've got enough faith to forgive people over and over and over again. But then notice the next paragraph. It looks like it's totally unrelated. But it's not. It's still about forgiveness. Suppose one of you had a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Would he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along and sit down to eat? No. That's not what the master says to the servant. Would he rather not say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready, wait on me while I eat and drink, and after that you may eat and drink? Yes, that's what servants do. They don't eat first, they eat last. They make sure the master eats first. And, and so far you've been saying, what does this have to do with forgiveness? It has everything to do with forgiveness. Here's the point. Would he thank the servant because he did what he told him to? No. So, you also... When you have done everything you were told to do, what have you been told to do? Forgive again. Should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. Forgiveness is simply a duty. We should not expect MVP, MVP status or hero status because we forgive people. It's our duty. So if you're a person who holds resentments and then you're going to be king of the mountain and think people are going to think highly of you, God says, no, forgiveness is simply a duty. Nobody's going to hand out awards to you because you forgave somebody seven times. You see how Luke does that? He takes a strand of this, 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 and he puts it all together. He's going to do that today in Luke 6. So, now that I've uh, explained Luke's modus operandi, let me ask you to stand as we read from Colossians chapter 3, which will be on the screen for us. Once again, we're going to be reading about forgiveness. Not entirely, but nevertheless, a portion. Verse 12 through 17 of Colossians 3. And so as a congregation set apart for God, that's the word holy, God has set us apart for himself. We live for his glory. And dearly loved by him. And since you, not you personally, but you congregationally, you as plural, have been chosen unconditionally by him, put on the wardrobe that is suitable for your special status. In other words, Christians, because they're dearly loved and elected and set apart for God, we wear a different wardrobe than the rest of the culture. Here's the culture. Here's the wardrobe. 
Put on the rope rope, rope rope that is suitable for your special status. Number one, heartfelt compassion. That's when you see tragedy and suffering and misery and unhappiness. You're not indifferent to it. You just don't walk by and go, big deal. No, there's feelings involved in your act of mercy. But then, uh, kindness. Humility. Humility is thinking of yourself correctly. The opposite is having an exaggerated view of your importance, an inflated view of your greatness. Humility is thinking of yourself accurately. Gentleness. I love this word. It's in the King James, it's meekness, which means strength, but strength under control. It's not about a control strength like a wild horse, but it's a horse that's been broken. And now it's safe for a little girl to sit on that horse. Gentleness. Long-temperedness. Macrothumia. It means patience. It means that you don't have a short fuse. And you fly off the handle and get that easy. It means you have a long temper. It takes a lot to get you wound up. Next, holding yourselves back from one another. And you want to get in someone's face and you hold back. Always graciously forgiving each other's faults. Canceling the debt, which is the idea here of forgiveness. I cancel the debt. They don't owe me anything anymore. The only nothing. No explanation. No apology. Nothing. They owe me nothing. Forgive each other as quickly and completely as the Lord has graciously and completely forgiven you. And regardless of whatever clothing you put on, always wear the outfit of love. The belt that holds everything together in place and produces perfection. Let the peace of Christ that let the, let the peace that Christ brings always be your umpire. That's literally the word. Your referee. Calling the shots. Settling disputes in your heart. Here's why. It's to peace that we were called. That is called by God as a body. Imagine a body like this at war with each other. <laughs> Imagine my right hand really has something against my left foot. That would be a tragedy. And cultivate an attitude of thanksgiving, gratitude. Cultivate. It doesn't happen overnight. It's hard to cultivate that attitude when tough things come into my life. Let the word about Christ take up permanent residence in you completely. And here are some examples of how to let that word of Christ take up, take up permanent residence. Here it is. Use the word about Christ as you, that's plural, you men and women, teach and admonish each other. Using wisdom to guide your efforts. Here's the second use of it. Use the word about Christ in songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. Do you see that the church is not supposed to sing one kind of song? There's a variety. And we really don't know what these songs mean, what he means by songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. It's not as simple as we think it is. But there's a variety of songs. And the word about Christ, you see, is supposed to be filling those songs. As you sing with grace in your hearts to God. Let every detail in your lives, your talking, your words, your actions, everything, be done in the name of the Lord Jesus through Him, giving thanks to God the Father. Before we sit, what came through to you? What struck you about the reading? please everybody all the time. You can please some of the people some of the times. Any other comments? Yeah. 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 Yeah
about this passage that we just read. Yes. Good, good thought, good observation. It requires cultivation, doesn't it? Cultivation is not easy, is it? You ever plow a field before? You ever plant a garden before? What do you got to go through to get there? Weeds, roots, stones. Dirt just doesn't irrigate itself, it doesn't. Oh, that, it would. It'd be nice if the garden would plant itself. <laughs> One final. Yes, big. Well, it, it, on the first page where we're supposed to have to wear these things, gentleness to kindness, it's almost impossible to teach people the word of Christ and admonish them if we're not actually wearing those things. If we don't have those certain qualities, then it doesn't, there's, it's almost impossible for us to teach and to admonish each other and use the word because we're not, we don't have the source of the robe on us to wear, have our whole flesh itself, which we would be selfish, we wouldn't teach, we would not be, we would not be forgiving or kind, so it, it just plays into both parts. you got to have one to have the other. Yes. Yeah, so make sure you got the word on first, right? Correct. Yeah. yeah. It's one of Paul's favorite metaphors, putting on clothes. And there's a reason for that. Put on this, put on that. It's a clothing word. He also says put on some things. Mm -hmm. Not mean get naked, but change. Right? <laughs> Exchange your word. All right. Let's pray together. God, before we encounter your word in Luke, Luke's Gospel, chapter 6, we want to admit that we're a needy people. Not one person here has got his or her act completely together. We're pilgrims. We're, we're journeying. We're walking. And we all can easily point out faults in our brother. That's so easy to do. But you want us to look at ourselves first. And you want us as future leaders of the church, future leaders to be characterized not by resentment, forgive, uh, but being a forgiving person, being one who grants forgiveness generously on a regular basis. This is what leadership is required to do. And these people here, men and women, are leaders and future leaders. And I pray that the Spirit of God would grab a hold of us, each one, none except our guests, as well as our regular, regular attenders, our members, our Redeemer, that this message will take us where you want us to go, out of the ditch, yes, out of the ditch of bitterness and resentment. And Lord, this is your heart. You can do whatever you want. We're not in charge. You are, and we're so glad you are. So do whatever you want this morning. We ask it. May have a seat. Thank you. Is there someone uh, in your circle of relationships this morning that you have only forgiven in word only? You've said, I forgive you, but in your heart you still hold resentment. And your actions demonstrate that you still resent that person. Am I talking to someone here this morning, either guest or a regular pretender that you are not still punishing them. We punish people by withholding forgiveness. We punish people by resenting people. We punish people by having a root of bitterness against people for someone who has injured us. Is there someone here who looks at your life and realizes that there's people in our past who have hurt us, injured us, gossiped about us, wounded us, and we still hold a measure of resentment towards them. Jesus knows the power of resentment. He knows that we put ourselves at risk when we hold on to resentments, when we hold on to unforgiveness and, and refuse to forgive people. Jesus knows we're at risk. We put ourselves in danger. And so in this battle against basically reciprocity, which is what Luke 6 is all about, he wants to give us some motivation to get out of this at-risk situation. And especially for young kids, if you learn, if you learn early in life to practice forgiveness, you will be in a much better place to be married. You'll be in a much better place to be a dad 
and a mom and a husband and a wife and a worker or someone who has to submit to authority at a school somewhere or in a hospital or in a law office or whatever it is you work. This reminds me of what happened to a nation who, when they were down, they were kicked. This is probably ancient history to many of you, and I wasn't around, you'll have to believe that. But at the end of the First World War, there was a treaty called the Treaty of Versailles. It was actually signed June 28, 1919. Germany had been beaten by the Allies, which included France, England, Canada, <coughs> and the U.S. But the Allies wanted their pound of flesh. The Allies had just defeated Germany, and Germany was in chaos. They had lost over a million casualties. Their economy was bankrupt. They were starving to death, and they had lost land. I mean, they had been beaten. But the Allies weren't satisfied. When the Allies drew up the treaty, and the agreements to the treaty, they didn't even invite Germany to the table. Germany had no say, had no involvement in that treaty, and at the end of the treaty, the treaty said, Germany, you will repay all of us nations that won money. They didn't have any money. And you have to accept the blame for the entire war. It's all your fault. So, they signed it. Because if they didn't sign the treaty, the Allies said, we're going to invade you. <laughs> what an option. Either sign or we're going to invade you. They had no choice. So the economy of Germany was a disaster after the war. They were losers in so many different ways. And so when the Depression came along 10 years later, 1929, it hit Germany harder than any other nation on the earth. And the country was filled with resentment and bitterness towards the Allies. You know what that did to them as a nation? It made them prime and vulnerable for a leader to come up and say, it's not your fault that you lost the war. It was their fault. That resentment was tapped into by a guy named Adolf Hitler, who himself had been in the war. It is defensible to say that the Treaty of Versailles basically caused the next war. World War II, because Germany was filled with resentment about what the Allies had done to them, and they needed a scapegoat. And Adolf Hitler said, you know whose fault it is? It's not yours, it's the Jews. And the Jews became the scapegoat. The power of resentment, the power of bitterness, makes us at risk for great danger. And so what Jesus does in Luke 6, and I ask you to turn there if you're not already there, Jesus knows our hearts. We hold on to things. Are you holding on to something right now? Are you holding on to resentment? Holding on to bitterness? Have you refused to genuinely forgive people? Jesus has a word for us this morning. It's in Luke chapter 6, verse 38, and it appears to be an analogy that has nothing to do with forgiveness. But let's read the text and I'll show you how exactly it has to do with forgiveness. Verse 17, I'll pick up from last week. And this is all in the context of forgiving. Don't judge, and you won't be judged, that is, by God. Don't condemn, and you will not be condemned by God. You see the reciprocity? Forgive, and you will be forgiven by God. Here's the next verse that seems so out of place. But again, remember Luke's M.O., his modus operandi? He inserts things into an argument to make a point. Give, and it will be given to you. See reciprocity? Just like don't judge, and you won't be judged. Don't condemn, you won't be condemned. Forgive, you'll be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Well, how much? How much will God give to me? Answer, a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. And then he clenches the nail here. 
He, here he clenches his argument and says, for with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Paul, or not Paul, pardon me, Luke is taking his analogy from the marketplace. This is what Luke does. He takes illustrations from everyday life that everybody understood, and he says, here's the point. When you went to the market to buy grain, like wheat or barley, you would go to a vendor. He would be seated on the ground on some sort of a blanket, and he would have his grain in big piles in front of him. And you would approach him with some sort of a measuring device, like a pot, a clay pot, or a basket, or he may even use his own lap. And you say, I want 10 measures of barley, because barley and wheat were used to make bread, the staple of life, the staff of life. I mean, you eat bread every day, and you make bread every day in the Middle East. And so if you said to this grain seller, this farmer, I want 10 measures of barley, what he would do is take your measure, your basket, and he would pour it in about three quarters full. And then he would shake it. <laughs> and then after shaking it to make sure that each head of grain sank a little lower in the measure, he poured more to fill the basket totally, then he would shake it again in a circular motion to make sure of what? That there was no room left in the basket for more. Then he would take his hands and push down, press down is Luke's word, he would push on the grain to do what? To make sure that he was filling that measure completely. And then he would pour to make even a cone like a, like a teepee, and he would take a pole and shove it down the middle of that teepee of grain and pour in more heads of grain. Finally, the measure that you had given him to fill is completely full. Well, what is Jesus' point? When you forgive people, when you extend forgiveness to people, God says that in response to you forgiving people, I'm going to pour blessings back into your lap, and I'm going to be liberal about it. I'm not going to uh, penny pinch blessings that I pour into your lap. If you truly forgive people, I'm going to pour untold liberal blessings back into your lap. You see how this is an incentive for us to forgive? He clinches his argument with the next phrase, for with the measure you use, it will be measured well back to you. So in a sense, we have in our hands the tool to determine how much God blesses us. And it's how we extend forgiveness. If you forgive people a little bit and then take it back, God sees what we're doing, and he withholds his blessing on your life. But if you grant total forgiveness to someone, absolute, total, complete forgiveness, God takes that measure that you used and pours blessings into your life. Who doesn't want God's blessings in their life? Who doesn't? Jesus knows how stubborn and how prone to pride we are to hold on to things, we forgive him and we take it back on Friday. We forgive him on Tuesday. So he gives us an incentive, a motivation. Jesus knows how selfish our hearts are, how we are inflated with how important we are, how cool we are. So he gives us this motivation to think about, do I want God's blessing or do I want the fun of cherishing my grudge against somebody? Which is better? So I'm, I'm talking to somebody this morning who has this habit of unforgiveness, this habit of resentment, I'm hoping that this illustration will motivate you to rethink your position today in life. To realize that God is withholding his blessing from you until you become liberal with your forgiveness. Regardless of what has happened, regardless of who did it, regardless of what they said or didn't do, God withholds his blessing on your life. You really want that? I don't! I want God's blessing. And I have that power within my hands. So do you. 
So I've said two things thus far, this morning. Jesus promises that God will what? He will bless us abundantly based on how we have forgiven generously. And secondly, to confirm that, to shore it up, to clench the nail, he says, the measure you use is the measure that God uses with us. As we think about how this applies to our life, a number of things come to my mind. And uh, I have more than usual this morning. Hopefully that will not be a detraction, but it will be a help to you. Uh, Jesus knows how prone we are to hold a grudge. And so, uh, to once again summarize what Luke has said, I pray that it will sweep up across the congregation this morning and persuade every one of us, every single one of us, to consider our role, consider our pattern, consider our habit of forgiveness. Now let's move to what forgiveness means. I'm not sure who created the word forgive. It's a little bit confusing, but the Bible uses in the New Testament three different words for forgiveness. They're all translated forgive, so you have no idea what they mean, but they all have a different nuance. And I think they're all worthy of bringing to the table this morning. So let me serve them up uh, for you. The first word is the Greek word afiemi. It's the word that Jesus uses in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are indebted to us. The word afiemi means to cancel a debt. Um, when the Israelite brought a lamb, to sacrifice, he was bringing this lamb as payment for his sin. He owed a debt to God. And so he gave the lamb to the priest. He himself cut the throat of the animal, and then the priest placed that lamb on the altar. The wrath of God, the punishment of God, fell on that lamb, and the sinner walks away free. God has canceled his debt and placed it on the debt, and placed it on the animal. So when we forgive somebody, we are what? We are canceling their debt. What are some debts that we expect from people who have wronged us? What are some debts that you expect? Well, you might expect an apology. You hold that person sort of in debt. But you take that debt, that IOU, and you tear it up. Tear up that eye of you. You owe me nothing. You don't owe me a confession. You don't owe me an explanation. You don't owe me any acting nice towards me. The debt is canceled. That's part of forgiveness. That's what God does to us. That's what we do for one another. We cancel the debt. So I'm debt free if I'm forgiven. The second word is the word that Paul likes to use in the book of Ephesians because it focuses on grace. It's the word charizomai based on the Greek word, charis. What does grace mean if it's attached to forgiveness? What does it mean to graciously forgive? Well, I think all of you have been in church long enough to know that grace is something that God does for us undeserved. God gives us something and we don't deserve it. We deserve the opposite. So when we graciously forgive, the nuance that I would like us to hear this morning is that we're not looking for people who deserve forgiveness. <laughs> we're not looking for people who've done something to deserve our forgiveness. No, we graciously forgive them, even though they don't, in our minds, necessarily deserve it. We forgive them whether they deserve it or not. That's to graciously forgive. The third word is used here in Luke 6.37. Forgive, and it will be forgiven you. It's the third word. I like this word. It's the word apoluo. Apollua was one of the very first words that a Greek student learns in terms of what it means. And it means this. I can do it with my hands. What did I just do? I let go. It's to release. It's to let something go. Have you heard that phrase with people? Let it go! Let it go! That's exactly what needs to happen. But wait a minute. What are you letting go of? What are you letting go of? Jesus says, forget it. Let it go. 
And God will let it go for you. What are we letting go of? Usually, it's expectations. And those unseen little thoughts in our head where I'm expecting them to come back to me and get on their knees and beg forgiveness. I'm expecting them to come back to me and say, you know what, I was wrong. In many, on many occasions, how long are you going to wait until that person comes down and gets on their knees and says, I was wrong? How long are you going to wait? You need two or three lifetimes because they're never going to come back. Let it go. Let go of those expectations. Let go of that grub. That grub. Grudge. Grudge too. Let go of that resentment. Let go of that anger. Let go of that bitterness. Let it go. And you know what? God will let things go in our life. That's what it means to forgive. But you say to me, and I gave you. I forgave him last Thursday, but a couple of months later, those thoughts came back up to me. How could she do that to me? How could he say that to me? He was mean and cruel. I get that. Here's where the third point for our takeaway comes into play. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 17 says about the new covenant. The writer of the Hebrews in chapter 10 is talking about Jeremiah 31 through 34. The new covenant that God would make with Israel in contrast to the old covenant. The new covenant says, your sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. No more. What does that mean? To remember is active, and to forget is passive. In the new covenant, which is established by Jesus on the cross, God says, I'm not going to remember your sins anymore. Does that mean he forgets them? No, but he chooses not to remember them. So when you forgive somebody in the pattern that God forgives us, what do we do? I make a promise. In fact, I make three promises. And it addresses the issue that I brought up a moment ago. The issue of, well, what happens when those thoughts come back up to me? Why did they do that to me? I can't believe that she did that to me. I make three promises. Number one, I will not bring it back up to myself. I'm not going to bring that back up to myself. So when that thought comes back up, I say, no, that's forgiven. Done. Forgiven. Secondly, I make a promise not to bring it back up to other people. Does God do that? Does God bring up my sin to other people? Your sins and lawless acts, I will what? Remember no more. He doesn't bring it up to himself. He doesn't bring it up to everybody else. And he doesn't bring it back up to you. He doesn't say, by the way, 10 years ago, did you remember you did that? I'm glad that God doesn't do that. Now, I think I may have skipped over an important part. Maybe it's number four. How do I go about forgiving people? I've made those promises. What do I need to do? I suggest this. If you have a litany, a, lo a long list of things, I'd say write them down on a sheet of paper. Take out a sheet of paper and write everything down that you believe happened. Write it down. Take a couple of days, maybe. Search your mind. Ask God to reveal things that you still are holding deep within you. Write them down. And then take that list, either with someone's help, a friend, a spiritual advisor, me, one of your elders, a friend that you can count on, man or woman, and go through that list and say, Jesus, you forgave me. And graciously, completely, I now forget this person of that wrong, that injury, that wrong, that sin. I forgive them. Go to the second one. Go to the third one. Go through the list and then take the list and tear it up or burn it or trash it. Do something with it to destroy it. And when those thoughts come back, what happens? You can say, no, you're done. I let it go. God forgive. I forgive. I'm finished. And it'll take a while. It'll take a while to your brain to catch up with the fact that you have forgiven it. Jesus is looking at future leaders, so am I. As future leaders of families and churches and communities and business and teams, athletic teams, you're going to get hit. 
Someone's going to kick you below the waist. Someone's going to stab you in the back. Someone is going to lie about you. Someone is going to gossip about you. Someone is going to deceive others about you. You are going to be wounded for the rest of your life. Deal with it. It's people. But what God wants us, of us as leaders, is to be able to give forgiveness on a regular basis, just as God has forgiven us. You'll be a much easier leader to follow if you're a forgiving leader. But if they know that you're one who holds grudges, gets even, sneaky little ways, passive aggressive ways, they'll see it and they'll become just like you. That's why in the next verse, Luke chapter 6, and I'm not going to go there, that's why in the next verse he says that blind guides lead their followers into a pit. Angry, bitter leaders lead their followers into pits. They become resentful and bitter as well. That's why a dad must be a forgiving man. Because their children will look to him for the pattern of their life. If dad is a resenter, the kids become resenters. If dad is bitter, the men become bitter. The boys and the girls have that risk of being bitter. I started this morning with the power of resentment. I'll end it. You are at risk. We are at risk. If we are resentful people. And that's what happened to Hitler. That's what happened to Germany. They were at risk because of their resentment. And Hitler came along with a bunch of BS about the Jews. And you know what? They believed him. And six million Jews lost their, lost their lives because of what? Resentment and bitterness being taken by a guy who was nothing more than a paper hanger at all Hitler. The nation was just ripe for genocide. And you put yourself into a position of danger if you hold resentment in your hearts. May God pour out his grace on everyone here who for whatever reason carries that baggage. This morning, let it go. This morning, let go. And I'm going to give you a chance right now to say to the rest of your brothers and sisters here at Redeemer, I used to be that way. I used to be someone filled with resentment. But Christ showed me a better way. If you will get up and admit that, if you will get up and put clothes on that concept, others will hear you and be encouraged and maybe be motivated to do exactly what you did. So let's stand. Who here would like to testify?